Welcome to the LDN Radio Show, brought to you by the LDN Research Trust. I'm your host, Linda Elsigood. I have an exciting lineup of guest speakers who are LDN experts in their field. We will be discussing low dose naltrexone and its many uses in autoimmune diseases, cancers, etc. Thank you for joining us. Today's show sponsor, Care First Speciality Pharmacy. They are leading compounders of LDN and other custom treatments servicing patients in over 18 states coast to coast. They are widely accredited to provide you with the highest quality demanded by the industry and the expert service you expect. To learn more, call 844-822-7379 or visit cfspharmacy.com. The LDN Research Trust's Facebook group has almost 18,000 members around the world. It is a great place to start your research and connect with others. www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash LDNRT. It is a closed group and only members can see your post. Nothing is shown on your page or feeds. Posts can't be shared. We do also have a page where you can share links. It's www.facebook.com forward slash LDNRT. Check out our books, conference pages by searching on Facebook. The LDN Research Trust also has a Twitter account and you can find us on twitter.com forward slash LDNR Trust. The LDN 2017 conference will be held in Portland, Oregon, in the US, 22nd to the 24th of September. If you are unable to attend in person, we'll bring the conference to you, regardless where you live. You can participate via our live stream. Check out www.ldn2017.com for early bird discounts. The conference will examine life-changing breakthroughs for treating multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, colitis, autism, irritable bowel syndrome, lupus, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic pain, mental health issues, restless leg syndrome and many other conditions using low-dose naltrexone. For tickets, live stream and sponsorship opportunities, Go to www.ldn2017.com. Today we're joined by Dr. Kat Toops, who's an MD from California in the US. She's a functional medicine doctor and a psychiatrist. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Linda. Thanks so much for having me. Well, this is really exciting. Before we start, perhaps you could give us some background of why you got into medicine in the first place. Why did I get into medicine? Well, that, that's, that's been a path. Um, I actually um, was studying physical and evolutionary genetics way back when, when we didn't know anything about genetics. And I got interested in medical genetics, and I was in graduate school, and one of my mentors suggested I would do better by going to medical school I would have access to working with people to pursue the research I wanted to do at that time. And so that's how I ended up shifting gears and going to medical school. I'd say in the first year there, it became clear to me that psychiatry was my passion. I loved working with um, people with psychiatric disorders. And, um, And so at that point, I kind of abandoned the research aspirations and and became a clinician. Uh, Later, I think when I finished my residency training, I I ended up uh, um, working as a professor at UC Davis for a couple of years. And 
um, left academics for various reasons and then ended up back in the research field. I started doing clinical trials and I ran a clinical trials research center for about 12 years. I probably did over 100 different clinical trials with all kinds of different medications, many of the medications that are out on the market right now for psychiatric disorders and fibromyalgia and sleep apnea and narcolepsy, all kinds of different areas. And I kept hoping that each new medication was going to help the suffering of my patients. And I would get excited. Every new mechanism of action, okay, here's something new. This is going to help. But what I came to see was the answer really wasn't in a pill that the kind of illnesses that my patients had could not be fixed just by giving them a medication, that they were multifactorial reasons and that the pharmaceutical route was not the answer. Maybe some of the medications did help relieve suffering for people, but they didn't solve the problem of why they were sick. So like many people that have come to the functional medicine table, I came into it with my own illness. I um, had immune problems sort of on and off uh, most of my adult life and finally crashed and burned with some serious immune illness. And um, of course, as a physician, I knew the limitations of what traditional medicine had to offer me. They could give me steroids to suppress my illness, but that wouldn't cure things. And so I started learning functional medicine at that time, and I suspect a lot of your listeners are familiar with functional medicine, but the basic idea of functional medicine is that we want to understand the root cause of why someone is ill, and it's usually causes, plural, because it really is never any one thing. And then as we address all of those factors and bring those things into balance, we can restore health and get people well instead of just leaving them with a chronic illness that they have to be treated for for life. So I started on the functional medicine path, I would say, about 2009 and um, went through all the various uh, training courses with the Institute for Functional Medicine and subsequently became certified there and um, started uh, as I recovered my health. I There was no turning back. Once you know functional medicine, you just can't go back to traditional medicine mm-hmm. when you have this tool. To really, really help people get well. So that's how I started started my functional practice. Um, the kind of patients that I treat in my functional practice, um, I would say a, a large majority of people have immune type illnesses or infection type illnesses. So um, many with you know chronic fatigue and um, and um, and then, of course, all kinds of mood symptoms that go along with um, with immune illness. So, so my patients kind of have the double whammy. They have the immune illnesses, and they're having a brain component, either psychiatric or cognitive problems, or both. So, I would say that I've ended up with a pretty complex set of patients, and I, I really enjoy working with very sick people because it's it's so much fun to help them on that path to getting better and and getting their health back when many doctors have told them, you're just going to be sick for life. You're going to have to take medication for life. And I I never buy into that. Mm -hmm. So just out of curiosity, before I I let you carry on, when somebody comes to you Mm -hmm. with all these complex conditions and symptoms, Mm -hmm. How do you go about finding out what the root cause is? Is it just well, a series look of blood it, tests? Uh, right. Well, certainly blood testing is an important component. I mean, the, the first thing that I look at is a timeline. So I have patients fill out quite detailed questionnaires that I can start to see what has been happening. So I start back with when your mother was pregnant, did anything happen? You know, did she have illnesses? Was she under a lot of stress? What happened at the delivery? Was it a vaginal birth? Did you have a C-section? You know, we know that people who are born by C-section um, and subsequently people who are not breastfed may have uh, lower levels of healthy probiotics 
um, than people who had a vaginal delivery and were breastfed because those are the mechanisms where we are inoculated with our, our first big doses of probiotics. Um, actually, some newer data is showing that we probably do pick up some probiotics in utero, but the, the big inoculation that we get is in, in the early weeks and, and months of our lives. So those kind of things are factors for people. Um, when I have people that have, were um, hospitalized early in infancy, you can imagine if people are hospitalized that they're probably getting pumped with antibiotics and so early antibiotics, these are all factors that will contribute to immune disorder down the road because we know that the the gut microbiome and our healthy probiotics are what control our immune system in great part. So if we don't have a healthy gut microbiome, then we can predict problems with chronic illness down the road. So then I'll look at the factors all through their life. What happened in early childhood? Did you have ear infections? Did you have allergies? Did you have colic? And then I'll look at the stressors happening in all those various factors. You know, what was your te- what were your teenage years like? Was it, you know, pleasant or was it a time of struggle and conflict? And what was happening in your family? What, you know, was it a, a high conflict laden situation? Was somebody a drinker? Was somebody uh, impaired by psychiatric disorders? Did a parent die or abandon the family? Because all of those early factors we're learning now, you know, they're called adverse childhood experiences. And, And we know now that when people have a lot of those factors, we can see immune disorders developing at higher rates, like 20 or 30 years later. So, um, you know, the notion of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, you don't have to be beaten or raped or, you know, some of the, the, the bigger factors that we think of with PTSD, but there can be all kinds of levels of trauma and stress that then are contributing. So I'll look at both the emotional factors growing up, and, of course, I'll look at all of the physical clues that might tell me how did they get to the state that I'm seeing them in now as my patient. So I'll create a timeline and look at factors. I'll look at the toxin exposures that they've had. I'll ask about tick bites. I'll ask about mold exposure. Um, those are, you know, of course, things that can affect the brain and the immune system. So, so taking a good history gives me a lot of clues as to what's going on with people. And then you asked about testing, and of course, testing is, is a big part of um, of what I do. And in functional medicine, sometimes we're accused of testing too much, but I think when you're faced with people with really complex illness, you have to just throw out a a wide net and reel it in and try to see what comes back. And so by testing a variety of factors, things will turn up that um, people will say, well, why didn't my doctor find that? Well, your doctor didn't test for that. I'm sorry they didn't test for that, but here it is, and now we have a clear treatment target because we, we found it by testing all the various factors. So, so definitely the testing for me is another important component. Mm-hmm. And what other tests other than blood tests do you carry out? Do you do, for example, breath tests for SIBO? Ah, SIBO. Well, SIBO is how I first learned about LDN, actually, and um, uh, years back, um, attending the SIBO conference, and for people who don't know, SIBO means small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and people who suffer from SIBO have a lot of GI issues. They typically have a lot of bloating and a lot of gas, and um, people can have a lot of irritable bowel syndromes, either constipation or diarrhea or both. And what happens with SIBO is we have a lot of bacteria in our colon, and that is normal, but we shouldn't have such a high level in our small intestine. But when the bacteria get out of balance, Um, they can grow into the small intestine and overtake that. And so when you eat certain foods that are fuel for those bacteria, they'll just have a little party with all that food and they give off gas. 
and bloating. And some people can appear six or seven months pregnant with a, the magnitude of the bloating with the SIBO. And so, um, and, and just as a digression as a psychiatrist, it's very clear when people have SIBO and the gut symptoms, that communicates directly with their brain. So we have the gut-brain axis. And whenever there's disruption in the gut, that causes uh, what, what we finally call leaky gut or increased permeability in your gut. And, and that allows, first off, food particles to get through into our bloodstream and then sometimes bacterial or viral or parasite components. And all those things activate our immune system. It's supposed to turn on when things get into our bloodstream, the invaders. And so when that immune system gets activated, it releases these inflammatory chemicals called cytokines to kill those invaders. And those inflammatory cytokines don't just stay in the blood next to the gut, but they'll travel around and they they freely cross the blood-brain barrier and they turn on the immune system in the brain. And when there's these inflammatory cytokines turned on in our brain, it causes psychiatric symptoms. And kind of the first thing that I'll see is anxiety. Sometimes people that develop immune disorders, they haven't been anxious all their life, but boy, it'll get turned on when you're having um, immune problems or SIBO problems. And then it can have depression ramifications. It can have cognitive ramifications. Um, and then even people who never had ADD can have ADD symptoms with, you know, uh, trouble paying attention and being distractible and can't focus. Um, so so I, I digressed a little mm-hmm. bit, but SIBO is where I learned about LDN and, and um, had never heard of it before in any way, shape, or form. But um, as part of the regimen for SIBO treatment, um, LDN is used theoretically as a prokinetic agent. And so the thinking with SIBO is that that you probably have some kind of GI infection. Your immune system turns on to fight that infection, and then somehow the immune system either stays activated or is attacking a component of your digestion that directs the peristalsis, the movement of your gut, um, called the migratory motor complexes. And so the thinking with LDN is that it somehow settles down that immune reaction and supports the migratory motor complexes to kind of wake up and function more properly so that people can quit suffering from constipation or diarrhea. So um, so that's where I first learned about LDN. And, of course, from that point on, particularly from the LDN Research Trust, I think I found you guys next and, and went to one of your conferences, and that's when it really broadened my appreciation of all of the various um, uses that um, I knew, now use LDN for with my patients. So I can't remember the beginning of your question anymore, but that answered some of it. (laughs) Okay. Well, we'll just have a quick break and we'll be back in just a minute. To listen to individual radio shows and interviews, go to www.mixcloud.com forward slash LDNRT. I'll repeat that. It's www.mixcloud.com forward slash LDNRT. Today's show sponsor, Care First Speciality Pharmacy. They are leading compounders of LDN and other custom treatments servicing patients in over 18 states coast to coast. They are widely accredited to provide you with the highest quality demanded by the industry and the expert service you expect. To learn more, call 844-822-7379 or visit cfspharmacy.com. The LDN Research Trust is very proud of the LDN book, which was launched at the LDN 2016 conference in Orlando and has been a great success, not only for the medical profession, but for the patients wanting to learn more about low-dose naltrexone. Full details can be found on the homepage of the LDN Research Trust. Discounts are available on bulk orders of the book, which is 10 or more, 
For details, email me, linda at ldnrt.org, telling me how many copies you wish and where you live. I will then be able to get Chelsea Green Publishing to contact you. Twenty seventeen special offer from Chelsea Green Publishing free shipping for US non bookstore retailers on orders of twenty five books or more. For full details, email me Linda at LDNRT.org. Welcome back. Okay. What I would like you to do now, um, Kat, is could you give us an example? of some of the patients that you've treated? Oh, sure. Gosh, there's been so many. And um, and I I would say I use LDN in, um, in a variety of, of um, situations. It's been um, probably best studied with immune disorders and with cancer. And so that's probably the scenarios that I first started using LDN beyond the SIBO implications. Um, with uh, cancer, cancer is really kind of the ultimate failure of your immune system. And so this is, to me, why LDN use with cancer is kind of a no-brainer. I feel like anybody who has cancer or anybody who has had cancer, um, if you've ever had cancer, it it means that the the symptoms all came together for your immune system not to uh, notice when your cells um, mutated or started to overgrow and and become cancerous. Um, so so cancer is certainly one place that that I have used it, and I actually work with um, one of my nieces who has a carcinoid tumor that has metastasized to her liver. And when I first started working with her, I definitely put her on LDN right away. And um, at that time, her tumor markers had been gradually and slowly increasing over a couple of years. Carcinite, fortunately, is a slow-growing tumor, but obviously in her case, it was spreading. And um, and I would say, um, you know, we certainly did other things, you know, nutritionally to support what was happening um, with her health and working with her diet and her stress. But I think the LDN was a big part in her case because now it's been oh, maybe two and a half, three years, and those tumor markers have definitely come down and they stop that upward march that I saw once I had gotten her records. So um, I would say that's a, you know, good example of one of my cancer um, uses. Um, with the immune uses, um, I, I use it for all kinds of immune problems. It doesn't work for everybody. You know, there's nothing that works for everybody, but to me it's kind of a no-brainer to try it because um, it's extremely well tolerated as far as um, side effects, and it's inexpensive, and you know it's not a not a burden as far as drug interactions. The only drugs it interacts with really are narcotics, um, and um, you know because the LDN is temporarily blocking your opiate receptors where narcotics act. You if you use narcotics while you are taking. LDN, it, it wouldn't hurt you. It just they wouldn't work if you had just taken your LDN dose. But other than that, it's pretty simple to use as far as drug interaction. So, so I think it's something that I always recommend my immune patients um, to consider trying. And um, I've used it for um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, unfortunately, a, a condition we're seeing so much more of these days with uh, probably from toxins and maybe fluorination um, that uh, displaces the iodine from the thyroid. But we're seeing a lot of Hashimoto's that I never saw earlier in my medical career. And with Hashimoto's, for some people, it can help the the um, the Hashimoto's so quickly that um, I always warn my patients that are on thyroid medication, if they start feeling hyperthyroid, like they're on too much medication, you can feel jittery or heart racing when, when you're on too much thyroid medication. 
um, I advise them to let me know immediately, and I give them a blood uh, a lab order to get their thyroid test right away um, because what I find is for some people they can reduce their thyroid meds um, because of because of treating with the LDN. And I've had people that have you know completely resolved their thyroid antibodies. Um, and again, that's not the only thing I do. I always work with the diet and the nutrients and you know other immune um, support. But I definitely know that to be a factor. Um, I've used it for psoriasis, and um, I started taking LDN myself because I have psoriasis. And I would say within days, I stopped needing to use topical steroids on my scalp, which is where I have it the the worst symptoms. Um, so I think I had another patient who told me within days her psoriasis started to improve, and she had more classic, um, more severe psoriasis with plaques on her elbows and knees. And now I can see the skin um, pink and clearing, but the lesions are all gone there. Um, I've used it with my multiple sclerosis patients. I've used it with Parkinson's patients. Um, I've used it with... Um, one of my patients that has multi-system atrophy, so some kind of um, immune disorder, uh, first attacking the cerebellum and now attacking other parts of her brain. Um, I've used it with a lot of fibromyalgia patients. And, and you know, fibromyalgia is one um, area where people say you should watch the side effects of LDN, that sometimes it might flare it up in the beginning and you might have to go start lower and go slower, and I really haven't seen much of that. I, I usually let my fibromyalgia patients know that that's been reported, and um, but I still go ahead and start with my standard dose titration, and, um, and I, I haven't really seen any big problems with them tolerating um, the side effects. Um, it, I use it for pain conditions. Um, we know that when you um, take a dose of LDN that um, it's reported to, uh, I mean, it, it temporarily blocks your own opiate receptors and that causes your own brain to make opiates. So your brain goes to check in and read how much opiates you have and it says, oh my God, we don't have any opiates today. We better make more. So your own brain is reported to make six times more opiates with a dose of LDN. And opiates, of course, are our feel-good hormones and that is also the component of narcotics that helps pain. So. Um, so LDN can be quite useful for pain conditions. And um, I've, uh, in conversations when I first learned about it, I, I um, was active on a lot of the LDN Facebook groups where I could read patients' stories and hear what they were experiencing. And, and I know I spoke with one woman there who told me she had been on high doses of narcotics for many years for uh, regional complex um, uh, what is it called, regional complex sympathetic um, blanket on the name of it at the moment, but, but it's, a, it's a neurologic pain disorder that can be quite disabling. And she told me that by using LDN, she was able to get off of her um, high doses of narcotics because it had controlled her pain so well. Um, so I'd say that's one area I use it for. Um, I use it for psychiatric symptoms. So I am a psychiatrist by training and I do general functional medicine now, but uh, of course many of my patients do suffer from psychiatric symptoms. And, um, and when I first learned about LDN, I thought, okay, we're giving somebody something that's causing their brain to make more opiates. And what is that going to do for psychiatric symptoms? Well, it does do things for psychiatric symptoms, um, being our feel-good hormone. I've seen it really help people's depression and anxiety. And the first time I saw so clearly that that happened, I had given it to uh, a young woman who was very inflamed, and we could not figure out the source of what was triggering her. Um, but I thought, well, let, you know, let's just try this and see if it might help that maybe there's some immune diathesis that's triggering her immune system and, and causing all this inflammation. So I started her on LDN. She came back five weeks later and told me a very stressful story about how she'd 
had an asbestos leak with her heater and that everyone in the family had been exposed, her two toddlers, they had to move out of the house. Mm -hmm. It was all of this drama and drama, and I was getting so stressed hearing this story. And she got a smile on her face, and she said, but my depression and my anxiety are gone. Mm -hmm. And my jaw fell open. I said, what? And she said, it's the LDN. She said, it, and it took away my depression and my anxiety. So even in the face of these tremendous stressors that she had to cope with, um, it resolved her symptoms. Um, so, so that was my first big eye opener that, wow, this really is having some, some beautiful effects for some people. So, um, so I, I have used it, um, with a variety of people for psychiatric syndromes. And, and I, um, I changed my strategy after last year's LDN research trust conference. There were two psychologists there that both presented some data working with veterans with PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And they were giving the veterans the LDN in the daytime. And typically we've given it at nighttime because that's a time when you're sleeping that your brain reportedly makes a lot of a lot of opiates. So we're giving it that, that boost by triggering a bigger response at nighttime. But we know that it does work when we give it to people in in the daytime because some people uh, can't tolerate it at night. The one, the biggest and most common side effect is that it can cause very intense dreams in the beginning. And I always tell people, you know, the dreams are not nightmares. They're just they're kind of hallucinogenic, kind of trippy dreams. Um, so they're not necessarily scary, but some people find that because of the intense dreaming, it will wake them up. And and usually that passes after a week um, to ten days is what I notice for most people. But some people end up moving the medication to the daytime because of that side effect, and we know that it can still work um, in that regard. So the psychologists were thinking, okay, why don't we give this a couple times during the day to see if we can get that endorphin increase during the day when these patients are really stressed and triggered um, by the PTSD symptoms. So they started splitting the dose and giving half of the target dose in the morning and half in the late afternoon so that people could you know, have uh, that uh, more pronounced opiate effect during the daytime. And they had some very lovely results with that. So since I learned that, I, I have shifted a lot of my patients who do have anxiety or PTSD symptoms to taking it in the daytime. And, um, and, and, and I tell them, look, if you forget your afternoon dose, no problem. Just take it in the nighttime. You know, it, you just get it in. It's sort of, it's not that precise that so you need to take it at a particular, particular time. But um, I've definitely seen some some nice results um, for you know for people with the mood disorders. So that's been an exciting target. Um, and can I, can and I'd like to can I just ask for yeah. the psychiatric yes. patients that you treat. How long would you say roughly it is before they notice any improvements? Um, I would say it's kind of insidious. Um, that one patient I mentioned with the asbestos exposure, I had seen her five weeks after she started, and she seemed to notice it within a few weeks' time. Um, with the immune disorders, as I mentioned, sometimes people can see responses almost immediately, and other times it's a slower response. So typically uh, the, uh, the teaching has been, and what I do is that I'll tell people, we're going to try this for three months, and if we don't feel like there's any obvious benefit after three months, then we should stop it. So um, it is something that you can maybe have immediate benefit and then you can see increased benefit over time as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry to have interrupt you, Karen. Do carry on. We can go on any tangents. There are lots <laughs> to talk about. I was hoping you were going to tell us about mold because that is a, uh, a big issue for many of our members. Oh, yes. Well, um, I do these days. The, the farther I get into the rabbit holes of understanding all of the factors that affect the brain that I never learned in psychiatry, um, 
infections and immune triggers are turning out to be really of great importance. And um, and mold is um, something that that is a, a huge trigger for the immune system and the brain. Um, it's not the mold itself. The mold releases mycotoxin spores, and those mycotoxin spores get in people's systems when they're exposed to the mold, and it triggers an immune response. And we know that about 24% of people have genetics that make them sensitive to mold illness. So anybody that's exposed to toxic mold will get sick. But if they remove themselves from that situation, their immune system clears the the response from the mold and they're fine. But about a quarter of people get exposed and, and they just cannot clear those mycotoxins and they keep circulating and triggering somebody's immune system. And so it's the immune response with all of that inflammation and cytokines that is, you know, causing the the physical and mental symptoms that we see. So LDN is one of my, you know, adjuvant treatments with mold because I'm trying to support the immune system, you know, while I'm trying to, you know, help that immune system and um and detoxification system clear the mold. So um, so it can definitely be a helpful adjunct with mold illness, both from the immune perspective and from the psychiatric emotional perspective, because when people are suffering from mold illness, it definitely is toxic for the brain and is igniting all kinds of symptoms in people's brains. I actually do a lot of work with... Um, with Alzheimer's and dementia and mild cognitive impairment, and and we're finding more and more that triggers like mold and Lyme and other brain-based infections um, are much more important in the development of dementia symptoms than we ever knew. We we've come to know that you know there's a big vascular component with dementia, and so your blood sugar control and your lipids and your inflammation, all of those factors are are, are definitely um, important in developing dementia. But um, I'm seeing even young people in their 20s that have symptoms of dementia that turn out to be from mold-related illness. So, um, so LDN is definitely part of my toolkit in working with that illness. So for people who've got Alzheimer's or um, dementia early stages, would mm-hmm. you recommend that they start LDN as early on as they could? Um, so... You know, I guess it would be what would be the factors um, with the dementia. It, it um, in some ways, uh, with dementia, obviously you want to move as quickly as you can, mm-hmm. and you know, not have processes you know develop. And so, if there's certainly if there's any hint of um, of immune diathesis causing and contributing to that, if there's any infections. Um, then yes, I would say do that. We, we uh, I have a uh, one of my dementia study groups with um, with Dr. Dale Bredesen, who's published uh, a, a lot about a functional approach to dementia, and now is training other um, clinicians in his approach um, to reversing dementia. We in our the study group that I that I am working on with him, we definitely have had some discussions about. Um, the use of LDN. And, you know, for me, I like to know that I have a target. So, um, and usually there's multiple targets, but, you know, if there's immune, if there's pain, if there's infection, um, if, you know, if there's mood, then those are all potential reasons. So I I definitely think that um, we're going to be um, probably seeing more use of LDN with cognitive impairment because cognitive impairment so often is from immune 
illness and infectious illness where it's helpful to support the immune system. Um, the infection, so, you know, Lyme disease and the co-infections with Lyme are another area that LDN is, you know, definitely put that on first line is, you know, what I think because what happens with Lyme disease is it shuts down the immune system, right? It's trying to suppress the immune response so that the immune system cannot detect and clear the Lyme spirochetes. And so LDN then becomes a mechanism to help support the immune system so that it can detect and and clear that infection. So so that whole spectrum of illnesses um, I also think is another use for LDN. Um, I've had some discussions with one of my friends and colleagues who works with PANDAS, and that's the Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsych Disorders. Um, what are those names? I can't quite always remember all the letters, but but uh, typically it, it's been reported in children that they'll have an infection, most often strep, but it can be caused by mycoplasma. It can be caused by other infections that trigger that child's immune response, and then the immune system starts attacking the brain, and, and um, these children can develop pretty acute onset of severe obsessive compulsive disorder and tics and behavioral problems. And um, and and I had recently worked up. Um, I don't normally treat children, but I worked up uh, a 12-year-old because of a, a family connection um, for his pandas, and um, and discovered you know that he had an infectious source with active mycoplasma. So I referred him to this colleague of mine. And um, and I had started hit that child on on LDN, and um, my pandas expert friend said that she definitely was using more of that with her her population as well. That's wonderful. Well, we'll just have a quick break, and we'll be back in just a moment. Today's show sponsor, Care First Speciality Pharmacy. They are leading compounders of LDN and other custom treatments servicing patients in over 18 states coast to coast. They are widely accredited to provide you with the highest quality demanded by the industry and the expert service you expect. To learn more, call 844-822-7379 or visit cfspharmacy.com. The LDN Health Tracker app, called My LDN is available free for Androids, iPhones, Macs, PCs, iPads and notebooks. The app allows you to keep track of all your medications, pain levels, sleep, quality of life, etc. You can print out graphs and charts to take to your doctor. Full details on the LDN Research Trust website. You can keep a journal so you won't ever forget anything again and set alarms. The app is free and all your information is held securely and anonymously. By using the app, you'll be taking part in the world's largest LDN survey, anonymously. Any questions, please email me, linda at ldnrt.org. Welcome back. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about LDN and infectious diseases, please. So, um, so you know, the idea of infectious diseases is that we should have a healthy immune system that should kick into gear and help us to clear infectious diseases. So we have, you know, a beautiful design that is supposed to work um, for some, you know, uh, for some kind of acute infectious diseases, um, those are places where, you know, a short course of antibiotics may knock things out and, and that will take care of things. Um, the problem that we get into is with the people that have chronic infectious diseases that are chronically triggering their immune system. And those are some of the kind of patients that I see. And, and they come in when I take their symptom history, you know, they have, you know, 
20 or more active symptoms that are troubling them. And you look at this and you, you know that a traditional doctor will look at that many symptoms and say, oh, my God, there's, you're neurotic, you're a psychiatric patient, you need to go see the psychiatrist. Well, I am the psychiatrist, <laughs> so I get, at least from my perspective, I can say, you have all these symptoms. This is not in your head. It's in your body. There's something happening in your body that is triggering the, the symptoms because people will tell me, I'll do whatever. If you, if you want me to take, you know, psychiatric meds, whatever, I just want to get well, you know. But, of course, the answer for me isn't giving the psychiatric meds because those, those don't give the, get them well. Um, I, you know, I may use psychiatric medications in the short term as a Band-Aid. If people are bleeding, they need a Band-Aid. And if, you know, a, a medicine is going to help them, I have, you know, no qualms about using that. But I, that's not the end point for me. That's just a Band-Aid while I try to figure out what is causing this chronic infection and how can I um, support their immune system to clear that infection. So, um so, you know, as I've mentioned, the LDN definitely is one part of the toolkit to to start helping support the immune system so that, um, and, and we, we haven't talked about this in the conversation, but we've talked about that the LDN blocks your opiate receptors and it triggers um, an increased response in your opiates. And the connection of how it works with the immune system is that those opiates bind to your T regulatory cells. And the T regulatory cells are a component of your white cells. That, and the white cells are, are our immune cells that help fight off infections. So the cascade is a little magic once it binds to those T regulatory cells. That the increased opiates, but but the net result is that it can support those immune cells to start functioning more optimally and can help um, settle down, particularly settle down um, uh, the you know the immune response that's attacking um, people's own tissues and their own bodies and causing immune symptoms. But um, with the infections, it's, it's, uh, it's still an immune response. The body is triggered to fight off some chronic infection, and it can be a low-level infection. Um, certainly a lot has been written about, about uh, dental infections. This is a really tough area where people have a root canal because they've had an infection in a tooth and the dentists take out the roots and they fill them up with the material and they say, okay, this tooth is cured. But what I've learned is beyond those roots, there's miles of microtubules and, and the infection can get into those microtubules and maybe it's a low level infection, but it can be enough to keep turning on someone's immune system. So the immune system still reads that as infection and it stays chronically turned on to try to take care of that infection. And some people with immune disorders just won't get well until they pull those root canal teeth because it's triggering this chronic infection. Um, it's a little harder to, to know and decide that for people. Um, but the important fact here is any kind of, of um, you know, chronic infection, even if it's a low-level infection, can be triggering your immune system, which then can cause any kind of immune systems that, that you know, it's, it's why we see people come in with so many symptoms all over their body that are seemingly unrelated, but, but those can be immune reactions that are happening. Mm -hmm. And I know that you took part in the Lyme disease documentary. Now, from my experience of people with Lyme, exactly what you were saying, they have so many different symptoms. They go to the doctor's. And even though these people are really obviously very ill, you know, unable to move, function, the pain cognitively, et cetera, et cetera. And the doctor says, it's all psychological. It's in your head. And how devastating right. when you feel that low to be told it's in your head um, and being oh, offered, you yeah. know, antidepressants and things. It's really right. difficult, isn't it? It, it? 
it's the worst. It's it's such such a, a devastating um, situation, and and you know I I and the whole notion of a somatization disorder is something that you know you have somatic or body symptoms, but it's really psychiatric and it's in your head and it's for some neuro yeah um, neurotic reason. Um, that that whole um, that that whole diagnosis to me needs to be ripped out of our psychiatric manual. Um, it, it is so devastating. So the first, my first job is to have people believe that, that they can get better mm-hmm. because when doctor says, okay, it's all in your head and you're just going to take these medications, um, just like with cancer, if you have cancer, the doctor says, okay, well, you know, you have a 25% chance of living. Well, all you're going to hear is you have a 75% chance of dying. And, you know, when the doctor's make these pronouncements, it's like a witch doctor in the jungle who shakes a bone at, at the, you know, the villager and says, you're going to die. And they go off into the jungle and they die, they die because they believe that, right? Mm-hmm. So the first that, that really I have to do is empower people and get them to believe that they can get well and that these symptoms really are of a of physiologic nature and that once we can, you know, find all the causes and support their nutrition and support their immune system, that, that they can get better. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a devastating thing. And, and I, I would like to tell you about a, a case with Lyme that had uh, uh, this person was was my friend. She was a really good friend of mine, and she was very ill from Lyme and Babesia, and um, she was quite cognitively impaired. Um, she could hardly figure out how to feed herself or get dressed. I mean, she was it was really eating up her brain and her body. Um, and I sent her to see one of my friends and colleagues who is a Lyme literate doctor. I don't consider myself, um, a, you know, a Lyme specialist out of necessity. I'm diagnosing it and, you know, working with the immune support, but, um, but I'm not an expert with um, any of the antibiotic treatments. And so I sent her to see my friend, and he put her on an herbal regimen for for her Lyme and Babesia. And I suggested that we start her on LDN as well. And my uh, the Lyme doctor said, well, I don't know that we should do that because we won't know what is helping her. And I said, who cares what's helping her? We just need her better, right? So we put her on the LDN and I say literally four weeks later, it was like a switch went off and bang, her brain came back, her functioning came back. It was quite dramatic. So in that case, I mean, she was doing other things, obviously. She was taking, you know, some some herbal protocols for the infection, but typically those herbal protocols take, you know, months to years to, to clear infections. In her case, I felt like adding the LDN just gave her immune system enough of a jump start that um, that it was able to help her clear that infection. I don't always see it as dramatic as in her case, but it was very dramatic in her case, just like a switch went off and her functioning returned. So I, I definitely think, um, you know, with, with Lyme and with chronic infections, it's kind of a no-brainer to at least get, you know, try the LDN to see if it can provide some additional support for people. Mm-hmm. Well, I would have to say (laughs) we've just about run out of time. We'll have to have you back. This has been very interesting. I've been quite quiet and I've been taking it all in. I have really learned a lot. And if any of the listeners out there (laughs) are in your area, how do they get hold of you? How do they make an appointment? Uh, um, well, my website has um, has the information. Um, my uh, practice is called Bay Area Wellness. So um, the website is bayareawellness.net. And I also have, uh, for people on, on Facebook, if, um, let me see, what is my Facebook site called? It's called Bay Area Wellness-Functional Medicine Psychiatry. And I just try to post interesting articles that are relevant to the brain and the immune system on there. So um, people are welcome to check that out. Um, I like to go back and read my own articles on, on there from time to time <laughs> because it's 
fun to find, um, you know, interesting research that, that um, you know, gives us hope and, and help for, for various ideas that people are suffering from. I also um, want to say probably some of your listeners are connected in, but there's a, an LDN Research Trust Facebook group, and there's some other Facebook groups regarding LDN for other specific conditions. And I know that was really helpful for me in my early days of learning more. It's always helpful to read other people's responses and and um, and questions. So I think those are good resources for people to learn more. But of course, your website, ldnresearchtrust.org, um, is the first place I send people. Um, you know, because you've done such a great job of curating all the studies and the data and the information. So I just want to thank you for all that you do. I know you work so tirelessly to help people to understand the benefits here, and and uh, and I certainly have. Um, have benefited from, you know, learning at your feet <laughs> for, you know, the place with all of this for all of us. So thank you so much, Linda. Really oh. appreciate you. Well, it's nice to be appreciated. Thank you. And as you were saying about learning from other people's experience, I think I have nearly 600 um, Vimeo videos where I've interviewed patients and it, that even mm-hmm. the doctors have found it really interesting, especially the not such common conditions where a patient is, is giving the story in their own words and you can hear the emotion in their voice. It adds something to it other than just reading a testimonial. So I'm very grateful to, to all those people that have shared their stories with us. But we will definitely get, yes. definitely get you back. Okay. <laughs> For people, right? The understanding that people can really get well and get better, that, that you know, that's the first step to hear those stories that mm-hmm. empowers people. So that's a wonderful resource that yes. you have. But you do feel when you've got a chronic illness, rather when you're really down and you're feeling really ill, very isolated, and you don't mm-hmm. really have... Uh, hope for a better future sometimes and I think we all need a little bit of uh, light at the end of the tunnel to to show us the way so keep up the good work and thank you very much well my pleasure my pleasure thank you for including me the LTN Research Trust has its own forum which can be found forum ldnresearchtrust.org or via our website. The forum is divided into sections so it's easy to navigate and find what you're looking for. You can share your experience, ask questions, keep a journal, etc. Unlike Facebook, the posts are always easy to find and don't get buried. We have a private medical professionals only section. To find out more, please email me Linda at ldnrt.org. Today's show sponsor, Care First Speciality Pharmacy. They are leading compounders of LDN and other custom treatments servicing patients in over 18 states coast to coast. They are widely accredited to provide you with the highest quality demanded by the industry and the expert service you expect. To learn more, call 844-822-7379 or visit cfspharmacy.com Any questions or comments you may have, please email me linda, L-I-N-D-A, at ldnrt.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciated your company. Until next time, stay safe and keep well.